Hi, I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. And this is Northwest Brew Talk. Welcome to Northwest Brew Talk, the number one podcast on Washington beer. This is episode 61. Each and every week we promote the Washington brewing industry by talking to those people involved in drinking Washington beer. If you like to drink Washington beer, learn about the people behind it right here on this show. With over 300 breweries in Washington, we try to highlight as many as possible every episode. If you're new to the show, we suggest you check out our back catalog with some great interviews and lots of Washington beer. This week, we have an interview with Ghostfish Brewing, our brew news, and local music from Sweet Clarity. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to send us an email to nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at nwbrewtalk and on Facebook at facebook.com slash nwbrewtalk. If you like the show and want to support us, share our link, tell your friends on social media. It takes just a few to start a revolution. All right. So let's start our show by opening our first beer from Pike Brewing Company. We've got their Double Hopulous. Pike Brewing Company is located in Seattle. They're open seven days a week and family friendly. They have a really awesome brewing museum filled with some cool memorabilia. Had a little struggle to get that one open. That cap did not want to come off. So make sure you check it out when you're in the area. Some really cool stuff that uh, the owners have in there. This double IPA is like a sunny vacation in the middle of winter. A bright apricot colored beer, Pike Double Hopulous, derives enticing flavors and aromas of stone fruits, pine, and melon from its complex hop blend. Their brewers have balanced these tastes with rich malt flavors, which will bring you back for sip after sip. This layered and smooth IPA clocks in at 8.5% ABV and is brewed with Chinook, Falconer's Flight, and Simcoe hops and then dry hopped with more Simcoe and Amarillo. As I said, ABV is 8.5%, 80 IBUs, and an untapped rating of 3.76. Okay, couple things. First off, it's a little past winter now. It is spring. Just a bit. But um, the other thing is that museum is awesome. The the memorabilia, um, there's a bunch of stuff that uh, we have that's going to be in Washington Beer. We have photos of a bunch of the stuff. Um, everything from signs to posters to bottles, all kinds of stuff. It's very cool. Yeah, it is. It's awesome to just walk around the place and look at all of the different things that they have. It's just, it, it's it's impossible to see it all in one visit, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to really look at it and read it. Yeah, yes, if you if you want to take it all in. Yeah. I mean, certainly you could glance at it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, so this beer is a uh, light copper color, I guess, and a uh, nice head on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not too bad. No, not bad at all. I like it. I've always liked all of Pike's uh, uh, yeah. beers. It's not as as you know, smack in your face as the double IPAs tend to be, which is something I like because I'm not a big fan of those high alcohol beers usually. Yeah, IBUs. I'm kind of surprised. It's kind of low for it for a double IPA. What is that number? Eighty. Eighty. Yeah. Which is what a typical IPA would be. Oh, uh, wait a second. On the bottle, it says ninety. Hmm. On the bottle, it says ni- IBU 90. So, that may be... Where did I get that number? I don't know. I'm pretty sure I got it, that right off their website. Yeah, so. It's possible when they when they bottled it, it changed. Who knows? That much? Or, I don't know. It is a lot. <laughs> but, this is not bad. No. I do like... Do like... Um, do like a lot of Pike's beers. They really do... They do produce some some awesome beers. Yeah, I don't think we've come across anything from Pike that we haven't liked. I mean, they've been no. they've been in the business for a long time, so exactly. I, exactly. I would hope they know what they're doing. They are pioneers, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah. As we get closer to the release of Washington Beer, we'll have uh, we'll have a list of events that we're going to be doing, and uh, Pike is in that list. That so uh, we'll def- definitely let you know. And uh, yeah, that's pretty good. I like that. Yeah, like and that a lot. now. On to the brew news. Topping this week's news, a recent article on Forbes.com discusses a second wave sell-off or what happens after a brewery sells to a private equity firm. At an event in Pennsylvania, some industry veterans explained it. Jim Cook from Boston Beer said, quote, funds have finite lives. When those funds lines get to the end, fund managers have to sell those assets, unquote. In other words, private equity investors don't want annual returns on an investment. They usually have a 10-year lifespan. Then they want to sell out and make a profit. 
That means to a bigger investment group going public or probably to another brewery. As an example of how this could play out, Victory Brewing co-founder Bill Kovaleski acknowledges that in spite of his confidence that his new private equity friends see in Victory, quote, a long runaway to grow and succeed, unquote, he and co-founder Ron Barchett won't necessarily be able to stop an unwanted sale or public offering. As the article states, the industry insiders and fans that are angry when a craft brewery sells out may be right, and in the end, they may end up owned by one of the mega beers. We'll see how this plays out over time. Yep, that is, uh, sounds like um, it's going to be exactly like a lot of the, you know, the fans when they complain. Sounds like it's going to turn out the way that uh, they believe. Silver City Brewery in Bremerton has some exciting news for 2016. They have added the first edition to their year-round lineup since 2010. It's called Nice Day IPA. It's available in 12-ounce cans and on draft throughout all of Washington State. And that is because Silver City also has full-time distribution to central and eastern Washington for the first time in company history in partnership with the Odom Corporation. They are expecting to increase production to 15,000 barrels in 2016, up from the record of 12,500 in 2015. North Jetty Brewing is celebrating their second anniversary on April 15th and 16th. The event takes place in their tap room with specials and fun and beer. Stone's Throw Brewery in Fairhaven will be opening this Friday after two and a half years of work and planning. We talked to them almost a year ago on episode 14. We can't wait to visit this weekend and we'll let you know how it all looks and tastes. Sumerian Brewing is celebrating its one-year anniversary this Friday, April 8th in the Brew Pub. All beers will be a dollar off for the day, along with food specials, raffle prizes, and a birthday cake. They'll have three special beers, a cask saison dry hopped with coriander and orange peel, a and cask triple IPA dry hopped four different times. Wow. Also, one of the first brews made on the small system when they started test brewing, June 3rd of 2014. This porter aged in a small French oak Merlot barrel and extremely limited first come first serve. Raffle prizes will be awarded every hour from 6 to 9 p.m. with a free raffle ticket just for attending. West Seattle Blog had info from West Seattle Brewing, which will be taking over slices on Alki at Alki Beach. They'll continue selling pizza and have 10 taps of their beer available by mid-month. Congrats on this new venture. Zip Whip a tech company based in Seattle, unveiled a new product last week, the Texturator. And why should you care about it? Because it's a robot that pours beer for you. Instead of waiting in line for a bartender, you text beer to the special phone number. The robot pours the perfect beer, then etches the last four digits of your phone number on the cup and texts you back that it's ready. I've always hated trying to get bartenders' attention, and for the people phobic in our society, this is very cool. Check out the video at zipwhip.com. And two more breweries are expanding. Kipsap Sun reports that Sound Brewery will be moving its taproom into Campana's uh, Italian restaurant, which is closing at the end of this month. They plan on opening by June 1st with beer and wine, guest taps, and food. Their original brewing equipment was sold to Rainy Days Brewing, who is, uh, and they are transferring the lease from their former location to Rainy Days, allowing owner Mike Montoni to expand from wholesale only and sell directly to customers. It's the uh, first time he's going to be able to do that. Very cool. Yep. He'll expand from his current one-and-a-half-barrel system to Sounds 7-barrel and hopes to have his location open by late summer. Lots of cool stuff happening, and that is the Brew News this week. Welcome to Building a Brewery with Bob and Jesse from Figurehead Brew. All right, it's been two weeks since we uh, talked to you last. So uh, what is going on at Figurehead Brewing? Well, so the big exciting news was our kettle and mash tun got delivered today, finally. Oh, awesome. awesome. So we got them into the space, and... It's starting to look a little bit more like a brewery now. <laughs> nice. So uh, with those in place, then uh, I think you said then you can finish building your wall? Yeah, so we'll put that fourth wall on the walk-in now and get that finished framed up. So start moving with some other projects. Awesome. So um, what? Uh, anything else going? Is that has that been the biggest thing that's been happened since the last time? Yeah, that's been the biggest thing 
hanging. We've kind of been waiting to get the the brew house, um, the kettle and the mash tun in because they're pretty big so that we can put the front wall on our walk-in and then we can insulate that and kind of be done with it, start putting our taps in and really making the place start looking like a brewery. Okay. Yeah, that would, uh, that's the goal, isn't it? To look like a brewery. <laughs> that's the goal. If it, at least it looks like one. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I know when we talked last time, um, it was on a truck. So did it take longer to get here? Yeah, it actually got delayed in Chicago for some reason. Uh, um, and it was about a week late. Leaving there. So. Okay. Well, as as usual, there's always there's <laughs> always, always something. something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, what uh, what is next on the agenda? Um, right now, we're finalizing our suppliers for things like our glycol chiller, uh, heat exchanger, some of that other equipment we need to get, and we're starting to think about kind of our interior design, how we want to, you know, decorate the walls and the interior decor very cool all right um anything else you guys want to add now before we uh before we let you go uh we got our permit issued by the city last week that was the other big milestone okay very cool so now now they're going to start inspecting us and watching us closer. Yeah. (laughs) yeah exactly now everything has to be up to up to snuff right yeah so I guess related to that, which might be helpful to people that are thinking about doing uh, the horrendously stupid thing that we're trying to do, <laughs> is that you once you get the DPD permit, that sort of tells you about all the other inspections you need to get. Yeah. The DPD permit tells you that you your plan is approved, and then you need to start wading through what the fire marshal wants and the you know, the kind of the plumbing inspector, electrical inspector, the brew house inspector, and all these other ones. Um, so we have to have another meeting to figure out what those uh, inspectors are actually going to uh, be required for that part of the process. Because they kind of give you a generic sheet for what you need to um what inspectors they have that you may or may not need. So we're going to figure out which ones we actually do need. And then uh, we have to still do the uh, TTB with the feds. And that seems to be going okay in our case. We've been staying on the, uh, on the woman who's been doing that and she's been pretty responsive. So hopefully we'll get done with that. Cause that can kind of be a hang up that can last, you know, three, four months to get uh, the TTB uh, licensing done. So, right. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds like uh, things are slowly coming together. Yeah, slower than we would like, but yeah, it's moving. Okay. It'll be moving fast now, though. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, Jesse and Bob from uh, Figurehead Brewing, we will talk to you again in two weeks and see what's happened uh, between now and then. All right, great. Thanks. All Thanks, right. Mike. All right, thank you, guys. Welcome back to Northwest Brew Talk. If you want to submit news to Northwest Brew Talk, send us an email to nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. If you've not yet subscribed to our podcast, why not do it now? It's free, available anywhere you listen to podcasts, including iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. All right, now... Let's talk to two of the founders of Ghost Fish Brewing in Seattle. They're a gluten-free brewery. I know you kind of went through this, uh, this story already, but uh, uh, why don't you guys give me a, a little bit of the overview of you know, how Ghost Fish started and you know, why you guys wanted to... Uh, to do a brewery that was you know, brewing gluten-free beer. Sure, as long as we don't have to tell the story of how we came up with the name again. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll avoid that. <laughs> um, I, I'll let Brian take it off because, you know, his, there's a couple threads to the story and his kind of starts before mine. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to try to be as brief as possible. But uh, it, really in the beginning it was uh, myself and uh, our other business partner, Randy, who's not here with us today. And uh, we were just two guys that uh, were starting to homebrew together and, uh, and, and, you know, enjoyed spending that time, that camaraderie together. And, uh, 
one of us had this crazy idea of, you know, threw out on the table that said, hey, let's, you know, start a brewery. And I think nobody said no to it. That was the problem. It's like it just we, we kept talking about it and nobody said no. And next thing we know, we're starting to plan uh, beer names and brewery names and tap handles, you know, all the fun stuff that comes with starting a brewery. Um, and the key to all this is that, uh, you know, we had no really – thought of being a gluten-free brewery you know in the beginning it was really um, just two guys really enjoying this the craft brewing scene uh, you know and feeling like you know that we could bring something unique to it but also understanding that at that time there was about 2,500 breweries around the United States with a projection to be somewhere around 3,000 so with that in the back of our minds um, I actually went to uh, the Great American Beer Festival uh, a couple of years ago uh, in Denver, we took my wife along, who is celiac, diagnosed about eight or nine years ago, and tasted a lot of the gluten-free offerings and, and really left with a kind of a disgusted feeling, you know, that uh, that there was a lot of beers that just weren't trying, uh, certainly not from a craft uh, aspect of things. So I came back, had a difficult conversation with Randy about, you know, mm-hmm. a change in direction of what we've been thinking about, and... Um, he thought about it, and fortunately, uh, he came back and said, "You know, yeah, let's do it." You know, but we both said from the beginning that mm-hmm. if we were going to go down this path of being a dedicated gluten-free brewery, and that was key, that we were going to be dedicated. We had no desire to to do, you know, a, a reduced uh, gluten beer, um, but we also were going to strive for putting out beers that the average craft beer drinker would enjoy. Mm-hmm. So, making beers for people who love beer first. But being very serious about, um, you know, the uh, elimination of, of uh, gluten, no cross-contamination, and, you know, and making sure that that was, you know, kept part of it and stuff. And so that was fine and dandy, but the fact the matter was is that neither Randy or myself really are brewers. Okay. <laughs> so we knew that we had to find somebody. And in our quest for finding somebody, you know, we went down a couple of paths. You know, there was a lot of people out, you know, in this in this world uh, and here locally that, you know, that want to break out from maybe being a assistant brewer or, or you know, mm-hmm. in that capacity. And so we talked to a lot of people um, and just really uh, found a lot of enthusiastic people, but nobody really knew anything about gluten-free brewing. So we kind of took a, took a break from that and said, okay, we need to regroup. And we said, well, let's look, dig a little bit deeper and go into the home brewing ranks. And uh, we kept seeing an individual showing up on a lot of uh, blogs, homebrewing blogs, but specific to gluten-free homebrewing. Um, we were following a blog uh, that was giving us a lot of good tips on how we can improve our own gluten-free homebrewing. And uh, unbeknownst to us was uh, Jason, my business partner here, that was going by a pseudonym and giving a lot of great information. He had been writing a, a blog called Brewing Beyond Barley. And fortunately for us, he was going through a, a point in his life where he was ready to make a life change. And it threw that out to the, to the universe through the Internet. And we caught, caught wind of that, sent a Hail Mary email down to him. And fortunately for us, he responded. And uh, fortunately, I guess double fortunate for us is that he wasn't living across the other side of the world. He was actually in Northern California. And uh, with that, I'll let him kind of jump in as far as how sure. that transition to, you know, you know, him getting the email and then him becoming part of the, sure. the team. Well, Brian kind of stole my big reveal at the end there, <laughs> but that's all good. It's, it's difficult to keep the two threads kind of separate. Um, so, yeah, my story is I have celiac disease. Okay. I got diagnosed when I was 25, and I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which, you know, there's so much great craft beer down there, which I had the luxury of enjoying up until my diagnosis. Mm. So... You know, if you're a beer lover and you've been drinking, like, the best craft beers in the country and suddenly your doctor says you're never going to taste that beer ever again, it's yeah. probably one of the most depressing things that ever happened to me, yeah. <laughs> especially once I realized what my options were as far as gluten-free alternatives. Mm-hmm. Uh, I definitely went down a rabbit hole with, like, sake and wine and whiskey and all that good stuff, but at the end of the day, when you want a beer, nothing else is going to do it, and... I tell you what, the early gluten-free beers that were on the market, you know, they were a first step, but 
really there's nothing there that's going to sate your thirst for something like a Northwest IPA or an American Stout or a Porter or Brown or anything. They were all kind of pale lagers and blonde ales, stuff mm-hmm. like that, basic drinkers. So, you know, after a while, I kind of started thinking, maybe there's a better way. <laughs> maybe it doesn't have to be like this. Maybe, you know, these people making these not-so-great gluten-free beers haven't really fully tapped the resources available to them. I, I had done a little homebrewing in college, you know, back before my diagnosis and hadn't really touched it for a while, but decided, what the hell, I still have all the equipment, let's dust it off and see what we can come up with. And, yeah, granted, my first several attempts were really not that great. <laughs> I definitely tried some weird and wacky stuff. But once I got my hands on some of this malted millet from a company out in Colorado called Grouse Malting and Roasting, uh, that was when I knew the game was about to change. Because with this stuff, you know, Grouse and their head maltstress, uh, Twyla Henley, is a good friend of mine, yeah, they're making a full range of specialty malts, mm-hmm. like dark roast, light roast, crystal, chocolate roast, pretty much anything you could want. So it didn't take me long playing around with that stuff to crank out some beers that I felt really proud of. And, you know, as soon as we figured out what we could do with this stuff, that pretty much solidified the direction we were going to go with Ghost Fish. And, you know, Brian and Randy were some of the first people to taste the beers I made with this mm-hmm. stuff, and that was kind of what sealed the deal for them, was I drove up from San Francisco with a trunk full of homebrew and we all sat out on brian's patio on a beautiful july evening and just you know pounded back some homebrew and realized that this was kind of a match made in heaven yeah so what i had read was you guys had the business idea you had the you had the brewing and that's kind of how it all meshed together then right absolutely but he actually uh, he surprised us you know we actually had this uh, thought that he might be our first employee i mean no. we, if things went well on this meeting yeah. that he just talked about you know, we were thinking about different offers and everything, and he had been thinking about opening up his own brewery as well, too. And, you know, what we discovered, and, you know, this, there's been this thread of power of three that has really guided Ghost Fish Brewing, you know, because being three three of us active owners. And um, we've complemented, you know, each other very well in the skills that, you know, one person has, you know, the other two might, you know, might lack in, but yet they hold the key to other skills that, you know, that, that I don't. So um, that was the case, you know, Jason, you know, certainly, you know, had the brewing. We could tell from tasting his beers, he knew what he was talking about. Um, and Randy and I came from, you know, extensive background in, in business and owning business and, and working within the industry, you know, as well. So, we really brought all, each of us a lot to the table. And, mm-hmm. and like I said, he surprised us and said, you know, how about me being a partner? Mm-hmm. And uh, that's really how Ghost Fish really was born at that point. Nice. So what, uh, what's the difference with millet? I mean, what is millet compared to barley? You know, how does that work and taste and everything? Yeah, well, it's a good question. A lot of people don't really know what millet is. Um, you might recognize it as bird seed, which is the most common place you'll see it. It's a tiny, round, little okay. yellow grain, you know, maybe about a millimeter or two in diameter. Um, super tiny, and that's kind of the main difference in working with it is we grind it practically to a flour in order to mash with it, and that presents some interesting logistical challenges in the brew house. But other than that, it performs pretty similarly. It, it has all the necessary enzymes to convert its own starches to sugars. You know, we do a s- single infusion mash, standard mash temperatures. We do supplement the enzymes a little bit, but other than that, you know, our brewing process looks exactly like you'd expect in any other brewery. So how big is your brew house? We have a 15-barrel steam-fired American-made Mark's <laughs> brew house. <laughs> so... When uh, when you're going from your your homebrew recipes, was there some experimenting to get it to up to uh, the larger system? Oh, good, yes, <laughs> yeah, you betcha. Um, surprisingly, most of the quantities scale pretty linearly, but the main trick was just our first few brews, just figuring out how this thing really worked. Because you know, I don't know if it's obvious, but I had no formal training in this. I had all of about a week's worth of instruction with some consultants we hired, and after that it was kind of like, well, let's figure it out. But, yeah, once we kind of got the kinks worked out and how the system actually operated, 
it's been a pretty straightforward process from scaling up recipes, like new recipes we develop on the pilot system. It's practically plug and play at this point. Okay. Well, why don't we why don't we try something here and then uh, do a couple more questions? Right on. So, what do you want to what do you want to do first? Hmm? Want to try this? Yep. This is your yeah, first right. anniversary Russian Imperial Stout. Okay. That's good. So that is a 12% beer, um, and it's it's kind of a commemorative recipe, not exactly based on, but loosely associated with the recipe of a Russian Imperial Stout. It was kind of the uh, <laughs> deal sealer when I met Brian and okay. Randy. Um, you know, Russian Imperial Stout was always one of my favorite beer styles, so it was one of the earliest attempts I really made. And this is kind of... A vast improvement on that old recipe, but definitely a nod in its direction. Yeah. Very smooth. Yeah, sometimes they're sometimes those are not that smooth. That one is very. Yeah, you know, a twelve percent beer, you know, can can come across, you know, often boozy. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, you know, nice thing about the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's this one, as you said, you kind of nailed it. It's very smooth. Yeah. It's an nice. easy drinker. Yeah. So, what uh, location here? This is an old factory or something like that? Steel foundry, in Was fact. It? Yeah, I, I'm not so good at giving the history of it. That's kind of Randy's department. <laughs> uh, maybe Brian could speak a little more yeah, on it was that. It opened in 1926. Um, and as Jason said, it was opened as a steel foundry. Um, I don't think any, any one of us know how long the steel foundry actually operated. Um, the place had several um, owners mm-hmm. throughout you know, its history. Um, had a little bit of brush uh, with his with uh, uh, with a celebrity actually. Oh. Um, when we moved into this place, uh, the the landlords asked uh, all three of us if we were familiar with the Gorlick family, uh, which none of, none of us are from the Pacific Northwest, so the, the name Gorlick didn't really mean anything to to, to us uh, until they said, "Well, how about Kenny G?" So Kenny Gorlick, oh. <laughs> uh, his parents actually uh, owned a manufacturing company mm. sometime after the steel foundry closed. And so uh, it's highly likely that a young Kenny G, you know, used to, to walk uh, amongst here. But the place actually sat empty for the four years prior to us taking possession of it, uh, August 1st of 2014. And... Um, yeah, I love the, love the wood beams and stuff. That's great. Yeah, we really fell in love with uh, the, the location. But really, the, it's the, as you, as you noted, in terms of the original timbers, yeah. um, you know, and the light, the natural light that comes in this place. And, yeah. and it had good bones, and it, we felt that, it, you know, it, it accentuated, you know, our plans. for. We really wanted to have a, uh, a space where people could come into the tap room and feel like they were part of the uh, brewing experience. Mm-hmm. So... Um, as fate would have it, you know, as we're conducting this interview today, while Jason and the team are actually brewing up our Shrouded Summit uh, Vit beer, and uh, everybody in the tap room gets to benefit from all the smells, yeah. and, you know, that come out of that today. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that. That is one thing. You, it's really open, so you can see. Some places, it's behind the door or somewhere, and well, it could be because of you know constraints for the buildings. But uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely cool that you can see it. That uh, you know what's going on there. Right on. Saturday's not usually a brew day. Yeah, we're kind of our schedule's all over the map right now because we're getting ready to sign with uh, distributors. Oh, okay. So it's kind of you know we just put in these two new thirty barrel tanks and I'm kind of getting my ass handed to me trying to figure out how to keep up with it all. <laughs> nice, nice. It's time to strap the cleats on and uh, you know and take this <laughs> to the next level. All right, let's try something <laughs> else here. You want to try the nitro? Nitro stout, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So again, that's our Watchstander Stout. That's the beer that uh, took gold in the gluten-free category, uh, beer category at the 2015 GABF. And I'll let Jason tell you about what what's actually what's in it. Sure. Yeah. So this beer is we think of it as more of a dry stout than the typical mm-hmm. American stout. Uh, kind of our take on a Guinness almost. Okay. You know, we wanted something that was you know roasty but still light-bodied. Um, you know, our big focus has always been on drinkability. Mm-hmm. We try not to make any beer that's you know, too heavy that you're just going to have a few sips of and then put down and push it yeah, away. Yeah, 
Uh, so our watchstander stout is made with five different types of roasted millet. It's kind of real malt showcase compared to some of our other beers, which tend to feature more hops or spices or yeast. Uh, this one is really, I mean, it's, we've got dark roasted millet. We've got Munich and Vienna and pale millet. We've got some chocolate roast millet in there. And uh, it is a recipe that is continually evolving mm-hmm. as, you know, we are kind of out in the wild west of the brewing world. We haven't really had any recipes to follow as far as roadmaps or inspiration goes. So I'm always making little tweaks to it here and there. Um, you know, you come back tap room in a month, you might taste a slightly different version of it. But needless to say, I think they're all kind of in the ballpark of what we were going for. So that the company that you get the millet from, they roasted all different yep. all different ways so you can get those different flavors then, huh? Yeah, they actually do it in uh, converted coffee roasters. So they uh-huh. do it like 30, 50 pounds at a time, something like that. It's all very hands-on. They're a very tiny artisan operation, so we're kind of their largest customer. Oh, really? Yeah. And the owner of, uh, of Grouse Malting, Twyla, as Jason had mentioned earlier, she actually has celiac as well, too. So wow. uh, she was at a point, kind of reached a fork in her life where she was going down a path of actually uh, thinking about brewing gluten-free yeah. beer. Uh, once she got diagnosed, and fortunately for us, she decided to go a different route mm-hmm. and open up uh, a malt house because, uh, as I like to tell people, you know, we couldn't do what we do without, you know, the malts that, uh, you know, we get from her company. And, um, you know, we're, we're her largest customer, so it's oh, a nice go. symbiotic relationship. All right, let's try the Peak Buster IPA. Double IPA? Mm-hmm. Double, IPA. Double IPA. That's good. Aside from the uh, anniversary beer that we put out at the beginning of February, the Peak Buster really is our our newest uh, packaged flagship beer. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, since Jason's the author of this and one that he's had high uh, high anticipation marks for for quite some time, I'll, I'll let him talk about that beer. Yeah. yeah, so we spent most of our first year focusing on session strength beers, you know, nothing really too far over 5%. But we didn't want to get pigeonholed as a brewery that just focuses on session beers. So leading off this year, we said, heck with it, let's put out a double IPA. So the Peak Buster, it's got a pretty basic malt base. It does feature some malted buckwheat, um, like our uh, Shrouded Summit Fit beer. Uh, But the big star of this beer is the hops. Uh, This features a variety called Eureka which is a pretty new variety. In fact, when we first got our hands on it, it was still part of the experimental breeding program at Hopsteiner. It was called, I forget the number on it, but the code name was Experimental Pine Fruit. Uh So we did a a single hop IPA with it back in our maybe second or third month of operation, and it was a big hit. Uh, So when it came time to do a double IPA, we kind of revisited it because we thought it was such a great hop, and now it's kind of the star of the show. So, what was it other than the millet that's in this? Uh, some malted buckwheat. Buckwheat. So, I mean, how do you how do you decide you're going to put buckwheat in it? I mean, where does where does that come from? Well, interestingly, despite the fact that buckwheat is not even remotely related to wheat, uh, botanically speaking, in the brewing sense, it actually contributes a lot of similar characteristics. It has kind of an earthy, slightly spicy flavor to it. It really enhances the mouth feel. Um, you know, so pretty much anywhere a uh, regular brewer would use wheat malt, we, mm-hmm. we use buckwheat malt. Oh, okay. Are there any other things you use other than, like, the buckwheat or the... Yeah, we, uh, we use some brown rice. Um, we recently started experimenting with uh, tapioca mm-hmm. as well as um, this heirloom purple corn, which is oh, yeah. really interesting stuff. You know, a lot of people have concerns about corn in general because of all the GMOs out there. So we we got our hands on this stuff, which is an heirloom, non-GMO variety. Mm -hmm. Um, We think it's really important that our customers know what they're drinking and know where it came from. But it's really exciting stuff. Very cool. Yeah, Peak Buster was on our show as a fresh beer a few weeks back. That's how we started talking with Brian originally. (laughs) And uh, it was good. Yeah, I think the... the, the, uh, Interesting thing about that beer is that all, although it's 9.4 ABV, it's deceptively smooth. Uh-huh. Yeah. You yeah. could trick yourself into thinking you're drinking a sessionable <laughs> IPA and realize that you've just had a, yeah. the equivalent of like uh, two or three beers, you know. You have that and, and your uh, Russian Imperial and you'll be done. That's right. Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> all right. This is your ghost fish? This is the grapefruit, grapefruit uh, IPA. Fish. So uh, when we first launched, we really didn't have a true IPA um, 
and uh, we really challenged Jason to um, to to really deliver you know a, a solid IPA that uh, that we could you know serve to our customers and um, he's got kind of a history of this beer and stuff but this beer has quickly become our number one selling beer um, it really kind of surprised us I mean it, it's now our part of our flagship lineup and, yeah. and last year we had no uh, expectations for putting out more than three beers as flagships yeah. and the ghost fit or excuse me the grapefruit IPA just kept finding its way into bigger and bigger uh, outlets and yeah. so we, we finally packaged it in 12 ounce cans and and uh, it's really took taken on a life of its own. Yeah, definitely have that grapefruit flavor. Yeah, this one was definitely a, a beer that snuck up on us. It started life, well, if you want to go way, way back, it started life as one of the very first gluten-free beers I homebrewed that mm-hmm. was actually good okay. that got me thinking, oh, hey, maybe there is some hope here. <laughs> Um, we revived it on the pilot system early on, maybe a month or so after we opened, just because at that point we only had our three flagships and whatever I could crank out a half barrel at a time. So, you know, we just took a good old tried and true recipe and uh, threw it on tap. Now we got our hands on some more experimental hops. Um, so this beer feature, features a, a hop that hasn't been given a name yet, but it came from the same program as the uh, Eureka. So currently we just know it as experimental grapefruit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the interesting thing is uh, my original recipe for the beer heavily featured a lot of grapefruit peel. Uh, but when we got our hands on this hop, it had so much grapefruit flavor on its yeah. own that we were kind of like, well, you know, we'll throw a little grapefruit peel in there just, you know, kind of for... Uh, superstitious regions yeah. i guess but most of what you taste as far as that grapefruit flavor really comes from the hop wow yeah. I, would, I would have thought it was real grapefruit that's that's how much is in there yeah now there's you know probably about 22 pounds of experimental grapefruit hops per batch versus about five pounds of uh, grapefruit peel wow so yeah grapefruit peel is really there just kind of for mojo wow that's, that's very cool so these ones are Newer session or newer experimental? You've got one of our flagships, our Shrouded Summit Fit okay, Beer right, on okay, here. We'll try that. And then you've got, uh, so this, the Saison was our was our lingering summer seasonal uh, last year. The Nut Brown Ale uh, is a winter seasonal, and then the Equinox is uh, experimental okay. that, that we just put out last week. Yeah, let's try the Wit Beer. So the Vit, the vit Beer that uh, that you just sampled, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's Similar styles like a, a Blue Moon or a Shock Top or a yeah. Ho Garden. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, the interesting thing about this beer is that typically, you know, it's brewed with wheat, and that would be the most offensive beer that you could put in front of somebody that has celiac disease or oh, yeah. has a gluten allergy. And I, I think this beer in this style, probably, in my opinion, is one of the most underappreciated styles that exist in Pacific Northwest. I mean, does everybody want something that's really jacked up with hops? Uh-huh. If it doesn't have an IPA behind it, you know, sometimes people just, you know, dismiss that. Mm-hmm. But the interesting about, thing about this beer is that being that, you know, Jason uses the Belgian yeast, which brings out a lot of banana and clove-like flavors, it's also spiced with sweet orange peel, coriander, and juniper berries. So it's got a lot of you know complex flavors to it mm-hmm. and it really pairs very nicely with i think spicy foods mm. like thai food you know oh, things yeah. like that yeah, yeah. that uh, you, it's refreshing it's also very sessionable it's four yeah. percent abv so you know it's one of those beers that uh you know you can throw back a couple and feel still feel pretty good yeah definitely all right let's try the brown Oh, yeah, that's definitely got a brown flavor to it. That's good to hear. (laughs) I like to think the beers taste like what we suggest they taste like. (laughs) It it does. So what's in the brown? Uh, So this one's another malt showcase, Mm -hmm. basically. Um, See if I can remember what the malt bill is on this one. It's a rather complex one. Um, Let's see. So we've got Pale Millet. We've got Munich. We've got American Roast, French Roast both of which are kind of somewhere between a, a biscuit and a chocolate malt. Okay. Um, and then we also think there's some chocolate millet malt in there, too. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, we, we kind of... 
you know, the, the ones that I'm not making every couple of weeks, <laughs> they don't stick with me oh, so yeah. much with the yeah. recipes, but yeah. So why don't we talk about uh, distribution? You, you're already out in cans, and um, how far are you guys uh, being distributed now? Uh, right now we're in about 240 retail locations as far north as Blaine, Washington, so right up at the right. Canadian-U.S. border, south to about the so- southern part of Olympia, uh, west to Port Angeles, and east to, I guess, for this east would be Enumclaw. Okay. Um, so, um, and that's keeping us busy, you know, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, we're constantly getting asked, you know, to, to bring our beer to other places. Uh, we're, we're, we're really excited about, you know, being able to increase the density here in western Washington but start to spread out through the rest of Washington and eastern Washington, as well as, uh, you know, we're, we already have a pretty big following down in Oregon that uh, okay. is, is patiently awaiting, you know, the the, the uh, ghost fish beer to, to hit the streets down there. So we have a lot on our plates, to say, yeah, to say the least. And uh, we also, one of our retailers, Marina Market, um, they actually do some online sales. Mm. So currently they are uh, basically a pipeline for people elsewhere oh. in the United States to order a beer, and it seems to be doing pretty well for them. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah, we are, we are getting our name out there mm-hmm. to other parts of the country. Are there any other gluten-free, free, completely gluten, gluten-free breweries in the country? Yeah. Oh, there's a there's a handful of them, uh, growing uh, seemingly on a yearly basis. Mm. Um, down in Portland, um, there are friends Groundbreaker Brewing. Their uh, IPA number five took silver in this or last year's Great American Beer Festival. Um, out in St. Paul, there's a brewery called Burning Brothers Brewing, and they are dedicated gluten free as well. Uh, Colorado, a brewery called Holidayly Brewing just opened up, and they use the same malts that we do. I mm. uh, haven't had the luxury of tasting their beer yet, but hopefully sometime we'll get out there. Um, also, out on the East Coast, uh, there is Orox Brewing Company, who they started as a, a nano brewery, and they're mm. currently in the midst of an expansion right now. They're in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, if I remember correctly. Let's see, am I forgetting anybody? Well, yeah, so there's also there's a handful of uh, gluten-free beers out there that are made under contract. Okay. So some, some brands like uh, New Planet or Steadfast or Bards, um, those are all 100% gluten-free beers, but they are made under contract by, you know, host breweries. Okay. Um, but all of those companies do take great pains to ensure the purity and safety of their product. So i got to give them props for that. Yeah, okay, very cool. So what, uh, you know, you guys, just this month is your first anniversary. So, you know, what is your, you know, what's the future hold for Ghostfish? Selling a lot of beer, hopefully. Um, You know, that's, I mean, we're just really in the midst of our first big expansion, um, you know, in addition to, uh, as Jason alluded to earlier, you know, we're we're pretty close to inking some contracts with several distributors uh, to help us uh, increase the density of getting our product out in western Washington. Uh, we're going to continue to evaluate distribution in other, you know, parts of the state and outside of the state of Washington. Um, here in the brewery, you know, we we really doubled our capacity. We added a couple of uh, thirty-barrel fermentation tanks uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, there's a shift in focus from now that we have five flagship beers. Um, we're, we're really shifting to more seasonal releases okay. or special releases. Um, and, uh, in fact, uh, we have uh, a spring release coming up that uh, is going to be a red IPA oh, okay. we're pretty excited about. Um, and then, you know, starting to talk about what the rest of the year is going to look like. Um, so continuing to, to, you know, build the foundation around us, making sure that, you know, that we manage our growth, um, but also capitalize on the opportunities that are out there. I mean, we're in kind of a, a, a obviously, a you know, a unique position and one that's uh, you know highly sought after in the industry. To, you know, people like our beer, want our beer, and are asking for our beer. Mm-hmm. We just have to make sure that we have all the the, the means to basically to sustain a business mm-hmm. um, and also focus, continue to focus on the quality of the beer. I mean, right, without right. that, nothing's possible. Right, right. Yeah, I think you said it great, Brian. I mean, we're we're definitely in a 
in a growth phase right now, but mm -hmm. we want to make sure we don't get too far in over our heads. Right, you know, right. we're about up to our necks right now, and I think that's a pretty good place to stay <laughs> so, so. for the time being. So, you're getting close. Yeah. Well, let's try these last two. The Equinox. Yeah. Whoop. Uh, what's the Equinox? That's one of your... That's a, a hop variety. Um, fairly new one as well. I think it just got its name early last year. Um, several breweries have been picking up that hop and doing some single hop beers with it. So we kind of wanted to see what all the buzz was about. Right. I think it's a really interesting hop as far as just having a huge complexity of flavor. I mean, you got some tropical fruit in there, like some mango and little bit of spiciness and also a, yeah. an, an interesting note that I can only really describe as like a green bell pepper. Mm. It's really subtle, kind of comes through on the back end. And I, I'd read that as a descriptor for that hop and thought, green pepper? That can't be good. <laughs> but actually tasting what it, it does in the beer itself, you realize, oh, it actually kind of makes sense in a good way. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. You know, the interesting thing on that, you know, that I'll just kind of piggyback what Jason said, you know, that... The Equinox being one of our uh, experimentals that, as I'd mentioned before, you know, we try to, to release, you know, one or two new beers, you know, every week. Um, we've had over 100, well over 100 different beer uh, beers basically roll through our tap room. And that really gets back to, you know, really the vision of Ghost Fish. You know, we, we never wanted to just be pegged as, you know, this uh, and and that may have been gluten free mm -hmm. and people's perception of what that is, but we really wanted to push the boundaries of what's possible with beer. Just yeah. like you know, a lot of breweries around the the, the state and around the, the country are doing. Um, and so, you know, it's using these experimental hops. You know, I mean, there's nothing really that is is um, out there that we really you know aren't able to to. to to try you know mm -hmm. so whether it be a beer style or a, a flavor profile or a particular hop and things like we get our hands on it you know and stuff i mean jason's he's got you know more recipes that haven't even come out yet so yeah. it's really kind of cool to see what's next yeah definitely all right last one here saison yeah so our saison was um it's kind of a synthesis of a few different versions that we did on the pilot system uh the, the first saison we did was uh, pink peppercorns and pomelo peel, which is really fun to say. Nice. Um, and that one went over pretty well. And then we did an elderflower saison after that. And between those two, those were, you know, we, we did a few others. Like there was like a smoked rosemary, uh, all kinds of other weird stuff. But the, the first two were really the sweethearts. So we thought, heck, let's mix them together, brew them up on the big system. And, you know, that's been kind of kicking around here <laughs> um, but it's it's a really far out beer you know there's yeah. really not much else like it especially not in the gluten-free world yeah definitely definitely well all the beers uh really good it's uh and like you said if somebody didn't tell you that they were gluten-free probably people probably wouldn't know uh but uh brian jason thank you very much for uh for joining us today appreciate it our pleasure thanks for being here mike michelle All right, thanks uh, to the guys from Ghostfish Brewing for taking the time to talk with us. We appreciate that. They've got some great beer, and uh, we've got a few more beers of theirs that we'll be uh, having sampling over the next few weeks. And we will be right back after this uh, local music break from the band Sweet Clarity. Shine. 
was a sense of clarity from sweet clarity you can check them out at sweet.clarity.bandcamp.com and that's uh, sweet as in a uh, luxury suite yes s-u-i-t-e if you want to have your music played on northwest brew talk contact us today and our second beer tonight is from no lie in spokane open seven days a week and family friendly tonight we are drinking slacker it may be the laid-back little brother of Brass Monkey, but he still knows how to get funky. This flavored ale has a smooth malt foundation layered with a zest of orange peels. The addition of vanilla beans creates a creamy, slightly sweet character that melds seamlessly with the robust citrus notes. Slacker is certainly a chimp off the old block. 6.1% ABV, 20 IBUs, and an untapped rating of 3.52. This is uh, The color is very, very similar to the last one. Maybe a little lighter, a little more golden, or um, whatever. It's got a nice white head on it. Oh, definitely. I can taste that vanilla in there. Oh, yeah. Vanilla, orange. I'm going to lose my microphone. Lose my microphone to a child. (laughs) All right. Yeah, that's some good stuff. Mm -hmm. These are available in, um, and this is available in a six-pack. Yeah. These ones you can get in a six-pack. Unlike most of the other ones that we that we test are either uh, growlers or bombers, but uh, yeah, there's a few, and uh, yeah, this yeah, I like that one a lot. Yeah, that's good. We're trying to help you out over there on the east uh, eastern si- side of the state. We need to get some more of your beers over on the western side, so we can uh, so we can test them. Yeah, not always easy to find over here, but we try. Yep, um, and that's some good stuff. I like that. I want you to give me fresh beer. Are you serious? <laughs> no. This week's fresh beer is now on tap at Middleton Brewing in Everett. That's my jam, strawberry wheat. This one has been their most labor-intensive beer. Smooth and cloudy wheat ale. It's brewed with 36 pounds of fresh strawberries per barrel. Its bold strawberry flavor and aroma make it a great sunny weather beer. Just in time. 4.2% ABV, 14 IBUs, and an untapped rating of 3.73. Per barrel. Oh, 
per barrel. That's a lot of strawberry. That is. It can't be cheap either. Oh, I'm sure not. Ooh, sounds interesting. Now, strawberry jam. All right. And you know what that is? That brings us to the end of this episode of Northwest Brew Talk. Make sure you tune in next week when we chat with Outer Planet Brewing. This show is written and produced by Michelle Rizzo and myself. If you want to contact us, you can email us at nwbrewtalk at gmail.com or on Twitter at nwbrewtalk. Our theme music is from Gilbert Neal. You can check him out at gilbertneal.com. Until next time, I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. Stay hopping, my friends.